I guess we can start and if people want yep. to join, they can just join later. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tian Wong from uh, Leiden University and he's going to speak about triple product periods in uh, RM theory. All right, well, thanks very much, uh, Peyman, and thanks everyone for, for being here today and for having me in this seminar. So like I was saying before, it's always uh, really fun to speak to a Canadian audience. Uh, it brings me back to those days where I uh, was a postdoc in Montreal. So it's really nice to see you all again, and uh, thanks very much uh, for having me. So today, um, since it's also evening time here, I'm, I'm having some tea and I thought it might be nice to uh, give a, a slightly more informal talk that is more aimed at uh, discussing some recent progress in joint work with Dharma on uh, rudiments uh, that go towards uh, the theory of real multiplication and whose aim it is to construct singular moduli for real quadratic fields that enjoy many of the same properties as singular moduli for imaginary quadratic fields that go back to the 19th century. But I sort of want to put it in a wider context, and so I'll discuss several uh, several works and aim it more at um, giving everything its uh, its proper place within the wider story. So that's sort of what uh, today will be. And I would like to frame everything in uh, one language, and that's the language of twisted triple product periods. And so I would like to take a couple of instances of closely related um, piadic invariants that have appeared in the literature in the past and view them all as special instances, of so-called twisted triple product periods. And I'll take a very pedestrian approach to this. And so today, this will actually uh, mean expressions of the following form. So they will be first order derivatives with respect to some variable S of the Pedersen inner product between two modular forms. One is just an elliptic modular form of one variable. And today the weight will just be two of that second modular form. And the first one is the more interesting one is an analytic family of Hilbert modular forms that specialize at S is equal to zero to weight one comma one. So that was sort of a mouthful. So let me just uh, put it on the slide. Uh, so G, S, Z1, Z2 is a two variable uh, family, analytic family of modular forms, Hilbert modular forms uh, around a point of parallel weight one. And F is an elliptic modular form of weight two. So you see here, I've taken the diagonal restriction and one might uh, hope to make sense of an expression like this because both things are of weight two. Take the Pedersen in a product. And if this first thing is a family, it's the, going to be the first order derivatives at this point S is equal to zero that will be of most interest to us. So those will be, that's, this will be the sort of pedestrian nomenclature I'll, I'll take today. Now, these arithmetic invariants encompass a couple of notable invariants that have appeared in the literature in the past, most notably uh, gross Stark units and Stark Hegner points. Um, and uh, related conjectures giving analytic formulae for them uh, that go back to work of Darmont in the early 2000s and uh, Dasgupta Darmont in 2006, as well as some more recent work on RM singular moduli that I did jointly uh, with Harry Darmont. Now, the upshot is that even though some of these invariants, of course, have already been defined uh, a while ago, their interpretation as a twisted triple product actually gives you a lot of leverage and it gives you an approach to actually proving things about them because their interpretation as twisted triple product periods will give them a natural relation to the piadic deformation theory of certain Artin representations, which are in turn very closely related to class field theory. And it makes them both theoretically more approachable as well as practically more computable if you're interested in machine computations. And so um, the first is what I'll focus on, uh, the theoretical progress that has been made on these questions. And the second I'll use to illustrate throughout uh, all of these invariants with explicit computed examples uh, to convince you that indeed they are very computable. Now, so I'd like to focus mainly on two different settings. Um, there's always a pair of algebraic tori uh, inside of the matrix uh, algebra. And there's a big dichotomy, there's a big difference between in this pair, one being split and the other being non-split and uh, both of them being non-split. And so I'll say more precisely what that means and to motivate all of this, I would like to briefly start by um, recapping the work of Gross and Zagier in the 80s on differences of singular moduli. All right, so let's begin there. And let's begin in the classical era of singular moduli with Klein's modular J function, which is a uh, unique SL2Z invariant uh, for the action of Mobius transformation, holomorphic function on the Poincaré upper half plane that has a simple pole at infinity and has a Q expansion starting off like this. 
Uh, there's a lot to say, of course, about uh, this uh, J function, but for the purposes of today's talk, I would like to focus on uh, their special values at uh, imaginary quadratic arguments, and these are called singular moduli. Now, singular moduli, as we all know, are always algebraic integers, and they're very rich algebraic integers that enjoy very rich arithmetic properties. And so here's a couple of examples, uh, j of minus 1 is 17, 28, which is 12 cubed. j of the square root of minus 5 gives that expression, which lies in an extension that generates over q adjoint the square root of minus 5 the Hilbert class field of q adjoint the square root of minus 5. That imaginary quadratic field happens to have class number 2. Um, and then finally, there's a famous example of Weber, the J invariant of the square root of minus 14, which is uh, an explicit quartic number, so it satisfies a degree 4 polynomial, um, and the uh, class group of Q adjoint square root of minus 14 is cyclic of order 4, and if you join this, you actually uh, obtain the Hilbert class field again. Now, initially, people were very interested in this because in the classical era, they had a very um, important role to play in explicit class field theory. So there are analogs of the theorem of Kronecker and Weber to generate abelian extensions of Q uh, in the context of imaginary quadratic fields, uh, also largely due to Kronecker and Weber and, and other people. That gave these singular moduli very early on uh, a tremendous importance in, uh, in number theory because, of course, class field theory was very much a hot topic uh, back in those days. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about late 19th century, early 20th century now. Uh, and so initially, that's where most of the interest came from. But then after World War II, it's a more modern history. Uh, the work of Gross and Zagier sort of th threw this wide open and uh, they pulled it wide open and, and brought it to um, actually used it to make non trivial a very non-trivial progress towards the Burton Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. This gave a whole renaissance of this topic of singular moduli. And just to briefly remind you, the setup uh, of the work of Gross and Zagier is that you have a pair of C endpoints, tau one and tau two, in the upper half plane. And um, what Gross and Zagier do is they say, let's consider the differences of singular moduli, j tau one minus j tau two. That's an algebraic integer, so I can consider its norm, and that gives me uh, an actual honest integer. And the first paper that Gross and Zagier wrote together, uh, the purpose of that paper was to give an explicit formula for that integer. So they described it uh, completely explicitly. So here's an example, for instance, the two largest uh, integers, singular moduli, um, are the following. So I factorize both of them. And if you subtract them from each other, you get uh, this following number. And so here's a picture also of Gross and Zagier, um, the closest approximation to uh, I guess the 80s, uh, I couldn't find, uh, I didn't spend much time looking for a picture that was from 1985, but anyway, uh, this is what they look like. And this is what the factorization of this difference of singular moduli looks like in this particular case. So you see that this number is, it's highly smooth. So it's divisible by lots of small prime factors to very exciting looking large exponents. And what Gross and Zagier do is they give a, an explicit formula for it, and it, they prove this explicit formula in two separate ways. And so the first thing that they do is they give a completely algebraic proof, and the algebraic proof relies very heavily on the theory of CM elliptic curves. So it uses CM theory, and more particularly CM elliptic curves, to reduce this computation of the exponent that appears in these primes. So for instance, here the three to the seven here. This seven, um, they interpret as a counting problem, <coughs> an intersection, um, of two cycles inside of a definite quaternion algebra, which is ramified at infinity, and q, q being the particular prime that one is interested in. And I'll give you an example in a second. Now, more interesting for us is the second proof that they gave, which is a completely analytic proof. And what's notable about this proof is that it doesn't use CM elliptic curves at all. And this is going to be important because if we're thinking of the setting of real quadratic fields, there is no good substitute for a CM elliptic curve. And so the analytic proof that is given in Gross and Zagier will be the more appealing one for us to reconsider later on. So we'll focus mostly on the analytic one. And the analytic proof revolves around a very explicit real analytic family of Hilbert Eisenstein series that was considered by Hecke in the early 20s. And so this is the 1920s. In fact, the paper of Hecke appeared almost exactly 100 years ago. Uh, it's a very nice paper where he, for the first time, writes down uh, these particular series, which I'll remind you of in a second. 
So let's have a brief look at both of these proofs, and then we'll focus on the analytic one and try and find good analogs in the setting of real quadratic fields for all the objects that appear. Okay, so let's begin with the algebraic proof. Traditionally, algebraic number theorists are more in tune with this proof. Um, uh, so instead of giving you, again, general statements in the spirit of tonight's uh, relaxed talk with a cup of tea, uh, I'll just uh, give you the statement by example. So I'll do an explicit example, and I'll do the particular example that was on this slide, and I'll explain for you this seven in three to the seven. I could have done 15, but I thought, you know, two, everyone always does two, so I thought I'd do the next one, three to the seven, um, and see where the seven comes from. I've already said that Gross and Zagier uh, give an interpretation for this exponent as an intersection, an arithmetic intersection number of two embeddings of the two imaginary quadratic fields into a maximal order of the definite quaternion algebra ramified at infinity and q. So q is equal to three will be the one that I pick for this example. In that case, we have a very explicit presentation for this quaternion algebra. And we obtain an arithmetic intersection number, <coughs> again, which I won't define precisely, but I'll show you in an example so you can guess the general definition, which is going to be given by a sum indexed by the norm one units in the maximal order of this quaternion algebra, which in this case is unique, modulo the stabilizers gamma one and gamma two of these two tori on either side. For each element in this sum, I'm going to count an intersection number of the embedding alpha one, which is the original one I started with, and alpha two, the original one for Q tau two, conjugated by this element B. Yeah. And what the intersection number is, is it's gonna be one, you score one point if you land in the same maximal order, and you score additional points for every um, congruence that you get between the images of the embeddings. Yeah. So here there's only one maximal order. So the six, there's 12 units in this quaternion algebra modulo the stabilizers, which are just plus or minus one. You get six contributions, all of which are ones except for the last one, which is a two. And that comes from the pair of embeddings, which I've put here on the slide for you. I briefly computed this. And you see that it comes from two embeddings of these uh, two um, imaginary quadratic fields in the quaternion algebra. And you can visually already see that there's a congruence mod three between the images here. And that's why this one additionally uh, becomes a two. Yeah. It's not a congruence mod nine, but it's, it is one mod three. If it was mod nine, it would be a three, et cetera. So that's where the seven comes from. And likewise, you, know, you can compute, you can guess now what the general definition is, and you can verify in this previous uh, uh, example that all the numbers are what they are supposed to be. Okay, so that's the algebraic proof, and it relies, uh, of course, very crucially on the theory of CM elliptic curves, where these orders arise as the endomorphism algebras of the super singular elliptic curves uh, mod Q. For us, it will be more interesting to look at the analytic proof. And so let's set that up. The analytic proof, uh, first of all, starts with the following diagram. So you have these two imaginary quadratic fields coming from our choice of uh, two CM points. They span a biquadratic field, which I'll call L in uh, what follows. And this L contains also a real quadratic subfield, which I'll call F. And chi is the character that cuts out this extension L over F. Now, in this setup, Hecke defined uh, uh, Hilbert Eisenstein series E sub S Z1 Z2. It'll be a Hilbert Eisenstein series over F. Yeah, it'll have two variables, Z1 and Z2. And um, it's defined as follows. So it depends on this parameter S. And it's an explicit sum weighed by the narrow class group of F of this character chi A weighed by some elementary factors. And then here we see that we get the expression for an Eisenstein series of weight one, except for convergence reasons, um, uh, Hecker puts in this additional factor with y1 and y2 being the imaginary parts of the variable z1 and z2. And then this absolute value here uh, with a two s in the exponent with the idea of letting s go to zero and constructing a holomorphic modular form in the limit. That was Hecker's original uh, goal, he wanted to construct a non-trivial holomorphic modular form of weight one comma one this way. And he did, but uh, unfortunately he constructed the zero form. And this is uh, something that's very important in the work of Gross and Zagier. So Gross and Zagier take this series of Hecker and they observe that actually, you see, if you take the diagonal restriction of this series, 
In fact, the statement I'm making here is true before diagonal restriction as well, but never mind that. Then this series vanishes when I specialize at S is equal to zero. So I, I get an analytic family of weight two forms because I've restricted to the diagonal. And if I put S is equal to zero, I just get zero. Yeah, but for other values of S, I may not get zero. And so what Gross and Zagier do is they study the behavior around this vanishing by computing the analytic first order derivative of this whole family with respect to the variable S. Now that gives them a weight to real analytic modular form, but they would like a holomorphic modular form. So they also take the holomorphic projection, Sturm's holomorphic projection operator. And all of these steps, they carry out in full detail. So they compute the Fourier expansion uh, of uh, all these operations applied to that family that Hecke considered. At the end, they have a completely explicit expression for what the Fourier coefficients look like. And on the other hand, they know they've constructed a holomorphic modular form of weight two on SL2Z. So they know they've constructed zero. So the expression that they have for the Fourier coefficients must also equal zero. And that's precisely what gives them their formula. So their formula is of the following form. The expression that they have will always have a contribution and I'll use these colors in what follows. There's this green contribution here, which is a more analytic contribution that has something to do with Green's functions. That's why I chose green. And then there's this blue contribution, which is a finite, more algebraic contribution, where these intersection numbers that we encountered on the previous slide appear again as weighting factors of a term log Q, and Q runs over finite primes. And this is a finite sum also. So this first Fourier coefficient must be equal to zero, and that's what gives them their formula. So they get that the green contribution is equal to minus the blue contribution, and that's it. That's the main result of the paper. Okay, so that's roughly the structure of their analytic proof. And now we've got to stop and wonder a little bit as to where we want to go with this. Um, and so let's give a, a quick preview. Um, so in, re in recent work with Henri Darmon, uh, we give analogs, or we, we construct piadic invariants that seem to behave in very many different ways, uh, like differences of singular moduli studied by Gross and Zagier. And what happens for us is that, again, we have a pair of embeddings, K1 and K2 in B. B will be the matrix algebra, but really it's not so important. It could be an indefinite quaternion algebra over Q in general. It has to be indefinite, though. To the first embedding, the K1, we attach an explicit cohomology class <coughs> in this cohomology group. So it's a cohomology group, it's H1, of the group SL2Z1 over P with values in M star over CP star. And I'll tell you in a second what this is. And this cohomology class will be evaluated at the second embedding in a precise way that I'll tell you about in a second. Now, what is this value group of these co-cycles? What is this M star over CP star? Now, this group SL2Z1 over P, the Ihara group, has an action by Möbius transformations. There's a weight zero action, left action on the holomorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane HP, and also on the meromorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane HP. And if we consider the group of uh, non-zero meromorphic functions on HP with respect to multiplication, that's this M star, modulo scalars, then that's the group we want to be valued in in this story with these co-cycles. Yeah. And I'll tell you, uh, at the end of today's talk, <coughs> a little bit more precisely what this definition is. But there are co-cycles for this group SL2Z1 over P valued in meromorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane modulo scalars. That's roughly the story. Now this evaluation at a second torus embedding, K2, gives us a well-defined piadic invariant. It's a piadic number, and it appears in many different situations to have uh, to mirror the behavior of the differences of singular moduli. Now, there's a very important point to make here, that there's a big dichotomy between two kinds of invariants that we get this way. Namely, we've switched from using the prime infinity and giving a real analytic or complex analytic treatment like in Gross and Zagier to a finite prime P and we're doing everything P adically. So infinity switched to P and of course, for Gross and Zagier, there was a pair of CM points where infinity, the prime infinity, was always non-split. We've switched to a finite prime P. And so for us, this finite prime P could be split or non-split in this real quadratic field K1. And the analytic invariants or the piadic invariants that you get out are of a very different nature 
uh, as you use either of those two cases. So when P is split in K1, this code cycle actually doesn't have any poles. It's analytic, so it's valued in analytic functions, modular scalars. And there's two types of invariants that you can obtain this way. There's the gross Stark units and there's the Stark Hegner points. So those uh, you get, you recover, and of course they were invariants that were already known before, but you recover them as special cases of this more general construction. The newer kinds of invariants arise when P is non-split in K1. So that's really a more close analog to what was happening in Gross and Zagier, where infinity was always non-split in an imaginary quadratic field, by definition of an imaginary quadratic field. Okay, so the talk will break up into this dichotomy as well. And the first thing we have to wonder is what plays the role of this Hecke analytic family for these other invariants? And that's a difficult question, but I'd like to give you some indication as to how this construction goes. Because this work of Gross and Zagier, of course, has been developed uh, ad infinitum since, since their original ideas. And it's a big flourishing area with many beautiful ideas. And so uh, there's so many people who've, who've uh, had big breakthroughs in this area, building on these ideas of Gross and Zagier. Most relevant for this talk, I'll single out uh, works of Kudla, also Yuan Zhang Zhang, and also Howard Yang. Now, what they do is they give a, a very streamlined modern viewpoint towards this construction of Gross and Zagier, and in particular, <coughs> this Eisenstein series that Hecke considered. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of more systematic way to construct those modular objects. And so the setup is that we start with uh, two embeddings of quadratic fields, K1 and K2, into, again, it could be an indefinite quaternion algebra over Q, but I'll just take M2Q today. We will then consider the quadratic space, which is B cross B, uh, so a product with itself, endowed with the following quadratic form. So um, this is going to be the trace from the biquadratic field L, defined as the compositum of K1 and K2, of the following determinant where this sigma, sigma is the automorphism of L over F. So let me just very briefly go back to this slide. L over F, this is the extension we're looking at. So before chi was the genus character here, now sigma will be the generator of that Galois group. And so that's the quadratic form I want to endow this space with, this B. Yeah, using an explicit isomorphism that exists between B and L um, coming from the two embeddings. Okay, so I'm being a little bit brief here. There's an explicit quadratic form you can put on this space. And this gives rise to a very interesting dual reductive pair where SL2F is the subgroup of SP8, I guess is what you get in this case. It's an eight dimensional quadratic space. So SL2 over F. And on the other hand, it's dual to, <coughs> to T, which is essentially the product of the two tori that you get from the two embeddings K1 and K2 suitably fibered over the norm map down to Q. They sit inside of a very nice uh, seesaw diagram where we have this dual pair T and SL2F. And uh, on the other hand, um, we can restrict the diagonal. We have SL2Q inside of there, which is dual. This should be O of B. This is, I think, a, a typo. Um, but we'll use the other arrow, the other direction here. And starting with a pair of characters, chi 1, chi 2, we can cook up this Hilbert modular form, which I call here theta chi 1, chi 2, via a procedure of theta lifting. And then we restrict it to the diagonal. So we end up in the bottom right corner. And that's really the object that seems to carry all this information, at least as soon as we start putting it in an analytic family. So that's a sort of a very rough sketch of a more systematic way of viewing uh, this uh, Eisenstein series considered by Heck. Okay, anyway, so let's uh, push on and talk about uh, case one. So the case where the first torus that we embed in the matrix algebra is actually going to be split. And remember, everything is with respect to P. So it's, it's, uh, it's non-split means... Uh, that P doesn't split, so it's locally at P non-split. And split here means it's locally at P split, but in fact, I'll consider an even more degenerate case where the quadratic form is even globally split. So let's fix the ideas here. So we'll pick a pair of embeddings of K1, which will just be a degenerate case. It'll be Q cross Q, and I'll embed that diagonally into the matrix algebra. So it'll just be the diagonal matrices, uh, standard split torus inside of there. K2 will be a real quadratic field where P is inert. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is the torus that's non-split locally 
at uh, p. Okay, so the relevant weight one one form that comes out of this um, more systematic machine over f, and f happens to be also isomorphic to k2 in this case, will be associated to an odd unramified character psi of the narrow class group of f. And it has a very explicit Fourier expansion. It's just an Eisenstein series. Yeah? So just like in the case of Hecke, where we had a pair of trivial characters coming from the work of Gross and Zagier, here there's a little bit more twisting going on. There's a it doesn't have to be the trivial character. In fact, it can't be the trivial character. It's a, it's a non-trivial unramified character, but it's still an Eisenstein series. So it still has that flavor of uh, what was going on in Gross and Zagier a little bit. So we're dealing with this very explicit Eisenstein series with this very explicit Fourier expansion where something's happened at P, this is a P stabilization. And so in this P stabilization, you see that an Euler factor has been removed from the L function, which gives the constant term. And also in the ideal sum, some ideals have been excluded from the sum, <coughs> precisely those that are divisible by P. Yeah? So it's a very classical object. It's a classical weight one one Eisenstein series of level gamma zero of P. And that's the object that we start off with. So now, of course, we need to start putting it in an analytic family, just like what happened in Gross and Zagier, this real analytic family that Hecke constructed. Now, of course, we'll be, have to be replaced by a piadic analytic family of Hilbert modular forms. Now, this is very nice because in the piadic world, there's a, there's a geometric object called the Eigen variety that classifies precisely all the ways in which you can deform, piadically deform uh, an, uh, a holomorphic modular form into a family of uh, eigenforms. And so th there's a, a geometric object that keeps track of all the possible families that you can put this in, Hecke eigenfamilies. It's called the eigen variety, and here's a little picture of it. Now, this picture is, it's a very specific picture that applies to this particular situation because work of Bettina Dimitrov and she has given a complete atlas of all the possible deformations of this particular modular form. So all the possible families that you can put this in, and they're visualized as follows. So the lower sheet here, this is a so-called weight space, and it keeps track of the pair of weights that you have of uh, your family of modular forms. So we start with this point, which is weight one comma one. This weight one comma one is a point in this weight space, and the point above it in this eigen variety corresponds to this particular form. And as I travel along this eigen variety, I'm deforming this modular form into a family of Hecke eigenforms. And we see that the picture that was proved by Bettina Dimitrov and she says that it's actually this eigen variety is et al over weight space. There's a cuspidal component, meaning there's a cuspidal family through this Eisenstein series that you can take in any possible direction that you like. It's a tal over weight space. And then there's also these two strands corresponding to two Eisenstein families. So much more classical objects because this Eisenstein series also lives in two Eisenstein series and they all intersect in that point. So this eigen variety has a very bizarre, complicated looking singularity at that point. So there's several choices that we could make. Now, in this joint work with Darmot and Pozzi, there's a very specific choice that we make, and we don't really have a very good explanation for why this is the right choice. It just happened to give us the answer that we wanted. So this particular direction seemed to be uh, relevant uh, for us, but uh, we never really saw this direction before, and it was just dictated to us kind of by the algebra. So it's still a little bit uh, mysterious where this direction comes from. So we'll deform it in the so-called anti-parallel weight direction. So that's the weight direction where the sum of the two weights is constant. That ended up giving us the clean algebraic expressions that we were looking for. Okay. So this GS Z1, Z2 will now replace this family of Hecke uh, that was constructed a hundred years ago. It's a p-adic family. So we've switched from an infinite adic to a p-adic family. And we now have this deformation, which we know for abstract reasons, exists by the work of Bettina Dimitrov and she. Now, we have one huge disadvantage over Hecke, because Hecke, of course, had a completely explicit description of his family. We do not have that. We just know that there exists a unique deformation in that weight direction, but we have absolutely no control over its Fourier coefficients. It's a very non-explicit kind of cuspidal family that goes through this, uh, this weight 1-1 Eisenstein series. And so we need an additional tool a tool that's purely piadic and that's unique to the piadic setup that we can use to compute the Fourier expansion of this guy, of this family G sub S, Z1, Z2. Okay. Now, 
very important fact on which the whole strategy hinges is the analog of what happened in the setting of Hecke, where the first observation was that if you restrict this series to the diagonal and you specialize at s equals zero, you get zero. So it's a family that vanishes in the specialization. Therefore, the first order derivative with respect to s is itself a good modular object. Yeah, before it was a real analytic modular form of weight two. This time we're in the piadic world and such things are called overconvergent piadic modular forms. Right? So this first order derivative, crucially relying on the vanishing of the specialization now becomes a weight two overconvergent modular form of uh, tame level one. <coughs> so this is very important. This vanishing, uh, I can't stress enough, is really important. And, it makes the first order derivative into a modular object. If it didn't vanish, the first order derivative wouldn't really be modular in any way that we uh, currently know. All right, so here's an example um, to give you a more concrete sense of what these invariants look like, <coughs> what we might do with this family, and also of the explicit and computable nature of all of these uh, things, because eigenvarieties, they have a sort of austere a kind of uh, reputation, but actually all of these invariants um, in RM theory are very, very computable in practice. And here's an example to try and convince you of that. Uh, let's consider the real quadratic field Q adjoined the square root of 21, and let's take the prime 11. Yeah. Now 11 um, is, um, uh, in this case, is, uh, is going to be inert in F, in this real quadratic field F. And we're going to end up considering modular forms of weight two and level gamma zero of P. And the space of holomorphic modular forms with those parameters is actually two dimensional. There's two examples. There's the weight two Eisenstein series E2. So this is the P stabilized version. Uh, it's a classical modular form of weight two and level gamma zero of P. P is 11, so I guess I could say gamma zero of 11, as well as a cusp form. And it's the cusp form associated to the following elliptic curve, which happens to be just X naught of 11, <laughs> with this explicit equation. Right, so we had to choose a character as well, psi, which was going to be an odd character. It's going to be associated to the quadratic extension f adjoined the square root of minus three. So it's the genus character of the factorization 21 equals minus three times minus seven. And what we can do now is we can just explicitly compute this uh, diagonal restriction of the anti-parallel weight deformation with respect to the variable s. It's an overconvergent modular form. Uh, and then we can pair it with the classical form E2 in the Peterson inner product in the space of overconvergent forms. And with E2 out comes the following quantity. So we get some piadic number out and we recognize it as some elementary uh, rational factor for which we also have an, an explicit uh, recipe times the 11 adic logarithm of this particular algebraic number. It's an 11 adic unit that lives also inside of this genus field in this case. So it's algebraic uh, and it's in this case, it's a, it's a gross Stark unit. It's an 11 adic gross Stark unit. Now also we could take the twisted triple product period with the cusp form F. Now in that case, we get a very different kind of invariant. Again, we get some piadic number, but we recognize it as some elementary rational factor times the elliptic logarithm on the elliptic curve E of the following algebraic point given by the following two coordinates, X comma Y, where X and Y fit this equation up here. So again, this is a numerical recognition of this point. And this example illustrates again, two very general conjectures that have been uh, stated a, a while ago. The first is it illustrates the conjecture, which is the algebraic nature of the RM values of the dedicant Rademacher co-cycle, which was stated in very different language uh, by Darmon and Dasgupta in 2006. And this conjecture was actually recently proved um, by Dasgupta and Kakte, as well as by uh, this work that I'm talking about now using twisted triple products jointly with uh, Darmon and Potsi. So there's two kind of independent proofs of this conjecture that came out in the same year. Uh, ours uses this twisted triple product interpretation and is therefore more relevant to today's talk because I want to talk also about RM singular moduli. The work of Dasgupta Kagde uses tame deformations of eigenforms and it should be noted that it's, it's much more general. So it's not just for real quadratic fields, it's for arbitrary, totally real fields and it gives the, an analytic construction of these uh, gross Stark units. So it's very spectacular work um, that uh, is also, also came out uh, in the past year or so. <clears throat> 
The second entry, the second example, numerical example that I gave here, is uh, the algebraicity of stark Hegner points, which in general remains open, it remains conjectural. It was stated by Darmont in 2001. He gave an explicit piadic point construction of what conjecturally should be global points on elliptic curves. The, the one on this slide being an example, but in general, this conjecture uh, remains completely open and it's not known that these points are always global. Okay, so anyway, uh, a couple of words about the strategy um, that uh, we employed with Darmo and Pozzi. So like I said, we have this family of uh, coming out of this theta lift, which is a weight one, one classical Eisenstein family. And we're going to put it into this anti-parallel weight family. And we want to compute its Fourier coefficients. And this is a highly non-trivial task because we only know abstractly of the existence. We have no explicit expression for the Fourier coefficient. So we have to compute and work hard to get these explicit expressions. And this is where a crucial new ingredient comes in that is only possible in the piadic setup. Because in the piadic setup, these analytic families, these piadic analytic families of eigenforms, are very closely related to the deformation theory of the associated Galois representations. And here we're always in the point one comma one. So these will be Artin representations, finite image uh, Galois representations, and their piadic deformation theory will therefore be related to class field theory. And that's where the algebraic numbers come from. So it's important to point out sort of where the algebraic numbers come from. They come out of the deformation theory of Galois representation. So in this particular example, the Galois representation uh, that we might attach to this weight one one Eisenstein series is just this reducible one consisting of the trivial character and the character psi that we picked of the absolute Galois group of F, the real quadratic field intermediate in the bi-quadratic field span by Q tau one and Q tau two. So that's rho. Now the strategy is we're going to, instead of deforming the modular form, we're going to deform the Galois representation because the deformations of the Galois representations uh, are naturally um, correspond to <coughs> classes in this cohomology group H1 with values in the adjoint representation of rho, which in this particular case, because it's a reducible representation, the adjoint splits up very nicely as just a sum of four characters. Uh, and so we get very manageable cohomology groups of characters, which we can then again, using inflation restriction and global class field theory, describe explicitly in terms of certain P units in the, um, in the uh, narrow Hilbert class field of the real quadratic field F, which is the field that, um, that is cut out by the character Psi. Yeah, so we get these very specific units that land in a Galois equivariant subspace completely dictated by the statements of global class field theory and the fact that deformations of these uh, characters or deformations of the Galois representations are just given by these uh, Galois cohomology groups of characters. Now, evaluations of these homomorphisms at suitable uniformizers give us gross stark units in this P unit group of the um, field cut out by the character uh, Psi. And so that's where the algebraic numbers come from. That's where the gross stark units end up coming from. Okay, now, of course, these are all the uh, deformations that we have of the Galois representations. We then need to be careful which of those deformations are actually modular, so correspond to a modular form. So we need a modularity statement there. And so to do that, this may be a little bit technical. So let me go through it uh, quickly because it doesn't really matter uh, for the sequel, we define some explicit deformation problem that captures properties that we know are true for modular representations. And then we hope we do, do, do this in such a rigid way that we cut out precisely those that are modular. And so the most important features of this deformation problem are that the deformations of this Galois representation should be nearly ordinary. Um, the, the, uh, that means that if you restrict them to the decomposition group above P, of which there's only one because P is inert, it, uh, it can be put into upper triangular form for some characters of the decomposition group. Also, there's a, we need to rigidify slightly to deal with this uh, singularity. And that comes down to choosing some rank one summoned that is stable under the local Galois group. And so this is part of the data of this uh, deformation problem. Okay, so it's a little bit technical. It doesn't matter so much, but we cut out these properties that we know are true for modular ones. It's representable by a deformation ring R, which we then show is isomorphic to T, uh, suitable Hecke algebra. And therefore we can compute precisely the um, deformations that we're after, which will correspond to this modular anti-parallel weight deformation that we set out to compute. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Okay, so never mind. So it's uh, in the end, it's it's a linear algebra problem after all of these things have been set up. All right, so back to the strategy and back to what Gross and Zagier do with this family. We now have this family, G, S, Z1, Z2, in the anti-parallel weight direction. Um, so what do we do with it? Well, we do all the same steps that Gross and Zagier do with it too. So we know the Fourier expansions explicitly now. And so now we're gonna explicitly comp compute the Fourier expansions when we start applying all of the analogs of the same operations that Gross and Zagier applied to their family. So the first being the diagonal restriction, which we know vanishes at S is equal to zero, it's very important. The second being the first order derivative with respect to S, and the third being the ordinary projection, which is the piadic analog of this holomorphic projection that appeared in Gross and Zagier. Now in the end, so here I promised you I was gonna use the same colors, we get, again, a very similar thing. I didn't define what this theta wind is. It's an explicit rigid co-cycle. It's an explicit co-cycle in that space that I had up <coughs> a little bit earlier that will correspond to sort of the analytic contribution, the thing that captures the analytic expression of which we're trying to show its algebraic, plus some finite algebraic contribution, the blue contribution, which in this case looks rather boring. It's just the piadic logarithm of this gross Stark unit that came up uh, a couple slides ago. Yeah. So again, we get these two contributions to the Fourier coefficients. And from this, we get again our identity in very much the same way that Gross and Zagier also got theirs. Yeah. Now, again, uh, it's very important that this uh, diagonal restriction vanishes at s is equal to zero. And we should point out here that it's a near miss because the first order derivative before diagonal restriction is not modular in any way uh, because the specialization doesn't vanish. It only vanishes after you restrict to the diagonal. And this is, this is uh, the price you pay kind of for taking a character psi where Gross and Zagier took the trivial character. So that extra bit of generality makes, makes for the fact that the first order derivative doesn't really have meaning. It only obtains meaning after diagonal restriction, which is still enough for our application. So we don't have to worry about it, but it'll become relevant in a second. Okay, so in summary, uh, this, these invariants existed, but this interpretation as twisted triple product periods of these uh, invariants has two key advantages. So first of all, it relates them to the deformation theory of Archer representations, which are in turn closely related to class field theory. And second of all, it makes them very efficiently computable. And so I've illustrated that with these examples that I've showed you uh, that are actually very computable in practice. And whereas the first part leads to theoretical progress and the full proof of this conjecture of Zermond das Gupta from 2006, the same is not true for stark Hegner points. Uh, some new geometric ideas still seems to be necessary uh, to obtain the conjecture on stark Hegner points, but already it does give a very appealing uh, algorithm or a way to uh, actually compute stark Hegner points that's somewhat different from the ways that people have considered before. And so I have a student, Howard Dam Johnson, who's, uh, who's working on these algorithms and has had some uh, successes at using this to compute examples. And these are the two references of the joint work with Darmo and Pozzi um, on this, uh, this kind of setting. Okay, so then we get to the non-split, non-split setting, which is the arithmetically uh, more rich setting, but it's also much more mysterious. And so uh, the things I'm going to say now are uh, joint work in progress with Harry Darmo. And I'm also going to turn the light on because it's, uh, it's getting dark over here in Europe meanwhile. Okay, so uh, like I said before, these invariants that came from the split non-split setting, they all corresponded to co-cycles in this finite rank Hecke stable uh, subspace of analytic co-cycles, so things that didn't really have poles. Now, what we'll do is we'll consider actually this much bigger space of meromorphic theta co-cycles, so things that are allowed to have poles. And I just want to briefly um, recap where this comes from. So this is a construction that appears in joint work with Darmon um, from a couple of years ago. And the inspiration for this construction came from the beautiful work of uh, Duke Imamolu and Toth, uh, and also work of Choya and Zagier that ultimately goes back to work of Marvin Knopp in the 70s. Now, what Duke, Imamolu and Toth were doing is they were considering a problem in topology. And so a problem about linking numbers of modular geodesics where the setup is that you take SL2R and you quotient out by SL2Z. And that as a threefold is diffeomorphic to a three sphere where the trefoil knot has been removed. 
Yeah, so this is a classical result uh, on modular groups. And this explicit diffeomorphism is interesting because it gives on the space S3 minus the trefoil a very natural uh, flow, the so-called diagonal geodesic flow. Uh, maybe it doesn't really matter so much what it is, uh, but it gives a way, here it is on the slide explicitly, but uh, feel free to ignore it. It gives a way to attach to a hyperbolic matrix in SL2Z a knot inside of S3 by following this uh, diagonal geodesic flow on this threefold. And so a question that Etienne Gis asked and answered is, what is the linking number between this trefoil knot that we've removed and these knots that we attach to hyperbolic matrices? And he gave the answer in terms of the dedicant Rademacher co-cycle. A piadic version of this dedicant Rademacher co-cycle was responsible for the arithmetic content of uh, the split non-split case that I just ended up discussing. And more interesting now for the non-split non-split case is the follow-up question asked by Duke Momogru Toth. Forget about the trefoil, they said. What about if you take two different hyperbolic knots uh, attached to two different uh, matrices, gamma one, gamma two, what is their linking number with each other? And there also they gave an answer in terms of this Knopp co-cycle, which is where we learned of this co-cycle in this work, um, that uh, gives an expression for this linking number in terms of a very explicit algebraic gadget that lives in an H1 of the group SL2Z. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we did in this work is we made piadic counterparts of these co-cycles. And we have actually two separate constructions. The first is just, it's very explicit. We just uh, uh, write down uh, an explicit infinite product, which is indexed by this group gamma, which is secretly SL2Z1 over P. I just didn't want to write that in the index because that's, that's a rather formidable piece of notation. But it's this infinite product over um, the gamma orbit of an RM point tau in the piadic upper half plane of these elementary factors, Z minus W, Z being the variable in the upper half plane, raised to the power, which is a sine of W, sine with respect to gamma. And what that sign is, is you take the cusp infinity, you act on it by uh, the matrix gamma. This gives you this green geodesic here. And then you check the geodesic between W and its unique algebraic conjugate, whether that intersects this green geodesic or not. And if it does, you put the sign of the intersection in the exponent, so plus or minus one here, or zero. Yeah, so in fact, very often it's zero. It's zero so often that this big infinite product over a huge dense subset of HP actually becomes a discrete subset. It has support on a discrete subset of HP. And so this infinite product has some chance of converging. And in fact, it does. And it converges to a co-cycle modulo scalars, as we show in our first paper. There's also a second paper where we give a different uh, way of viewing this construction. And we attach actually a, a rigid co-cycle, so something that's valued in M star, the meromorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane, not just modular constants, but actually M star to every um, weakly holomorphic modular form of weight one half and level four times P, where you're allowed to have poles, but only at the cusp infinity. This is very much analogous to the theory of Borchardt's products. So it's possible to take uh, several approaches to this. And it should be mentioned that whenever you have such a theta co-cycle, which seems like a bizarre object, you can actually uh, consider well-defined RM values, evaluations of these co-cycles at RM points. And the way you do that, it, maybe it doesn't matter. Let's just skip that. So you can take your co-cycle and evaluate it in a well-defined sense to get a piadic number out. And those piadic invariants seem to carry a lot of uh, uh, arithmetic content. So there's a couple of papers here with Darmot. And the first one is where the construction first appears. And then this Borchardt's products construction is a more recent paper here at the bottom. All right. So they're called RM singular moduli. And to convince you, here's an example, again, to convince you both of the computability and the algebraic nature of our constructions. This is the biggest example we ever computed. So th that's why there's so many numbers on this slide. Uh, you, most examples are much smaller, but you know, in the interest of uh, you know, just giving a, an example that's as striking as possible. Here's the biggest one that we ever got. So we get this co-cycle attached to our first choice of RM point tau one, which happens to be this point. It's discriminant 13, so that has class number one. 
And then we evaluate it at the six points of discriminant 621. That has class number six. So we get six separate piadic invariants, all of which are roots of the same polynomial. And it's this polynomial here on this slide. Now it looks gigantic and a little bit random and unappealing, but the, the largest of the numbers will give us very good sanity checks um, for the conjectures that we state in DV1, which again, I will just uh, illustrate on one example leaving you to guess what the general conjectures are. And you can look at the papers if you want the precise statements. Now, there's two main conjectures that we make in DV1. The first is they're algebraic numbers. Yeah, so they satisfy this degree six polynomial. That looks fine, but the polynomial is so big that we may not have been fully convinced yet. But it turns out that it generates the ring class field of conductors 621, uh, just as we might have expected for a difference of singular moduli of two CM points. So they are algebraic and they lie in a very specific ring class field of conductor 621, the conductor of the points that we evaluated the co-cycle at. The second is that we give an explicit conjecture for the factorization of these algebraic numbers. And here, if you factor the constant term of that huge polynomial, you get this guy. So again, very similar to what was happening in Gross and Zagy, lots of small primes to some exciting large looking exponents. And in fact, the conjecture for the factorization is exactly the same as that in Gross and Zagier. If you just formally switch the prime infinity with the prime p, and so you work with, instead of a definite quaternion algebra ramified at infinity and in q, you work with an indefinite one ramified at p and q. And you get exactly the same statements, and we verified those in hundreds of examples, and they all work out perfectly. So we're very much convinced that the conjectures are true. So we'd like to prove them. Uh, okay, so this is yeah, just an illustration. Um, the algorithms of James Rickards compute these intersection numbers in these indefinite quaternion orders, because that's a non-trivial computation, which conjecturally give us the exponents in our factorization. So it's the computation that we did in the definite case on the very first slide that comes back here with a vengeance, but James Rickards computed all of these and he computed those intersection numbers. And if you can tell, they agree perfectly with the exponents that appear in this factorization. And so this is what the general statement looks like. The exponents are given by intersection numbers, this time of geodesics on indefinite Shimura curves ramified at P and Q, in this example, P being equal to two. Okay, so very analogous conjectures about these things. So now, of course, we would love to prove these conjectures. And given that we could do it in the split non-split case, we may wonder if we're bold, perhaps we could try the non-split, non-split case, which is more analogous to what was happening in Gross and Zagier, where we have two tori where P is inert. Recall for Gross and Zagier, P was infinity. So infinity being inert means two imaginary quadratic fields. For us, K1 and K2 will be real quadratic, but P will be a finite prime chosen so that it's inert in both. All right, so the story then starts very similarly. We need to wonder what is the analog of this Eisenstein family of Hecke? And now things get much more complicated. Um, the relevant weight one one form that we need to consider over F, the real quadratic field intermediate between K1 and K2 in the bi-quadratic field L spanned by both of them is associated to a pair of characters chi1, chi2 of opposite signs. This is important to make this uh, into a holomorphic uh, Hilbert modular form, and it gives a cuspidal Hilbert theta series. Now, the eigenvariety, again, in, in different work, has already been charted for us. And so in this case, we know that this weight 1, 1 cusp form that we have, Hilbert cusp form, can be deformed essentially uniquely in any weight direction that we like. So the picture looks simpler than what it was in the Eisenstein case. There isn't this singularity anymore. Now things are nice and smooth and just et al over weight space. So the deformation theory looks much more boring in this case than it was before, but the arithmetic and the way of connecting them up to the RM singular moduli is much more challenging and much more rich in this particular setup. So it doesn't, it comes from a different angle somehow, the difficulty here. Now, that being said, the deformation that ends up being relevant to the story this time ends up being the deformation of this partial weight one direction. So it's a, it's a unique deformation, which we know exists and is unique, of weight one plus s comma one. So as s varies, the second weight remains constant and the first starts varying. So it's yet again, slightly different weight direction from before, which is a little bit magical, but the algebra dictates 
that this is the weight direction that we should be interested in. And everything becomes very clean in this direction. All right, so then the question is again the same. First of all, can we describe the Fourier expansion of this family? Right? For Hecke, this was easy because it was constructed explicitly. For us, it's constructed in a very abstract roundabout way and we have no control over its Fourier coefficient. So we're gonna again have to uh, consider a Galois deformation problem to figure out its Fourier coefficients. But that's only the beginning of our problems because after that, we're gonna have to restrict to the diagonal, take the first order derivative, et cetera, and relate it to these RM singular moduli, which is where most of the work happens in this case. Now, as far as the deformation theory goes, what we do is with this pair of characters, chi one, chi two, this will define some uh, wisely chosen, let me just call it that without telling you too precisely how you should choose it wisely, wisely chosen character psi of L, the biquadratic field, which is of mixed type over F, meaning that the induced representation from L to F, which I've called rho here, is actually uh, totally odd. So it's associated to a holomorphic Hilbert modular form, which is a theta series in this case. Now that's the guy that we need to deform in this case. And doing that, we can again make an explicit family G, S, Z, one, Z, two. So the, the left hand of our, uh, or the left entry in the Petterson inner product that gives us our twisted triple product invariants. Yeah. Now, then the next step is to proceed again, very similarly to what happens in Gross and Zagier uh, by considering, first of all, the restriction to the diagonal. Oh, this is a very bad error I made. I say vanishes at s is equal to zero, but the whole point that I wanted to make is that it doesn't vanish at s is equal to zero. So that's a very unfortunate typo, so excuse me for that. Anyway, so we consider its diagonal restriction. It no longer vanishes at s is equal to zero, but for now, let's put a pin in that and not worry about it too much and just formally consider its first order derivative with respect to s. And of that first order derivative, take the ordinary projection just as before. Now, in the absence of this vanishing, the modularity properties of this gadget that we've cooked up are much more mysterious. It's not modular in any conventional sense of the word, but it does have this really appealing feature. The first Fourier coefficient of this series is a piadic logarithm of these RM singular moduli, again, the green contribution, plus some finite algebraic contribution coming out of the deformation theory of that art and representation. It's finite, it's simple, and it consists of algebraic numbers or logs of algebraic numbers in the compositum of the two ring class field. So it has exactly the kind of flavor that we want. Uh, in the first Fourier coefficient, we find these two essential contributions. Yeah. So it mirrors beautifully what happens in Gross and Zagier. The only problem is that because Gross and Zagier had a pair of trivial characters, they had vanishing at s is equal to zero. But we are forced to consider a pair of non-trivial characters just by the nature of our invariants. If we consider the trivial characters, then we don't get anything holomorphic. We're forced to take non a pair of non-trivial characters. And in that case, we no longer get vanishing. So the thing that we computed the first Fourier coefficient of has no ostensible modularity properties. Yeah? So there's various ways that we have to try and get around that. It seems to be a genuinely new kind of modular object that behaves in many ways like uh, a piadic version of a weak harmonic mass form that has its specialization, which is a holomorphic modular form, as a kind of analog of the shadow of a weak harmonic mass form. And the first order deformation is a kind of piadic analog of the mock modular form part, which in our case contains all of the juicy arithmetic substance. So it's a very exciting looking form, but it, it doesn't really live in any space that one can make sense of. So that's a little warning that I wanted to uh, give at the end and in the absence of specialization, things need not vanish. So just to wrap up, um, what we've done is we started off by discussing kind of two waves of CM theory. A uh, singular moduli originally uh, were very important in the context of explicit class field theory, uh, but then later on gained even much more importance in the work of Gross and Zagier when it came to the analysis of Hegel points on modular Jacobians and the work of Gross and Zagier, which all started with differences of singular moduli. Now for this RM theory, so to try and find analogs for real quadratic fields, 
we use this Knopko cycle, which came from a topological motivation in the work of Duke in the Mogul and Toth, which leads to the definition of two different kinds of very computable p-adic variants. The first corresponding to the split non-split case, they give us nice algebraic numbers, uh, which are p-units in ring class fields, but their factorizations at primes different from p are trivial. So they're arithmetically a little bit less rich. There was p-units. They never have any interesting factorizations except at p. That's their only factorization. For the RM singular module, like of course, to the non-split non-split case, we do get interesting factorizations uh, that mirror exactly the statements in Gross and Zagier, where you formally replace infinity by p. And so the mysteries of this p-adic setting, meaning the absence of a good substitute for CM elliptic curves, is compensated by using this analytic approach and using this additional injection of information coming from the fact that piadic families are very closely related to Galois deformations, which in turn are very closely related to class field theory. And so we hope that these kinds of ideas will enable us to establish many more cases of all of these constructions of piadic variants, which previously have contained have remained uh, uh, conjectural. And so uh, we hope that these kinds of ideas can be pushed even much more uh, well much further in the future. So with that said, I think I'll stop because I'm over time a little bit. And thanks very much for being here today. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, well, thank you for a great talk. Hey, okay, questions. Uh, this was a really nice talk, Jan. <laughs> no, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. So I hope you'll give us your slides. Maybe you correct your your bad, very bad typo, which emphasizes oh, yes. the points very nicely. Absolutely. No, but that, that's a nice trick, right? I mean, it doubly emphasizes the point that you made. To, it would just slip by otherwise. In this way, it, it, <laughs> you <laughs> hammer the nail. That's, that's right. right, actually. It's clever. Okay. <laughs> so in the spirit oh. of uh, making an error there, because this this actually is known as Hecker's sign error. So um, yeah. the fact that it, it vanished and Hecker thought it didn't vanish. I did the yeah. opposite here. so. <laughs> Sign right. Thanks. I, I wanted to just make one, one quick comment about this business about taking the derivatives and worrying about modularity. Um, this is a phenomenon that's, that comes up when you study the theory of Eisenstein series in a standard way. And that is that in general, just think of SL2. Uh, what really from an analytic point of view, an Eisenstein series is a way of intertwining and introduce an induced representation, which is you know just a, from the Borel to, to the SL2 into, with, it has an S parameter in it into the space of automorphic forms. And in other words, for a generic S, it's just an intertwining map from this induced representation into the space of automorphic forms, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when you, when you look at the, uh, you can specialize that. And then what's true is let's suppose we're at a point where there's no pole. Okay, so that I'm worrying about Eisenstein series, which where the analytic continuation is gonna be defined and so on. But suppose you're at some point where there's no pole Mm -hmm. Then what in general would be true is that the leading term, that will be an intertwining map. It is you can just evaluate at S equals whatever you like, like zero or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that'll be an intertwining map from the induced representation into the space of automorphic form. But uh, if you, if, if, for example, you look at the next term, right? So you look at the derivative at S equals zero, right? What happens is that if you, if you calculate that derivative, so you calculate before you evaluate at S equals zero, but you calculate the intertwining aspect. In other mm -hmm. words, the intertwining means that there's some way which in the induced representation S is, you have an action dependence on S and in the modular forms. What happens is that the, the image will now, I mean, the, the, the resulting map, when you do the derivative, will be intertwining modulo the image of the first map. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you look at the first derivative into the space of automorphic forms, from this induced representation. If you take the space of automorphic forms and you divide out by the image of the value map, okay? Yeah. Uh, the image of the induced representation on the value map, you get an intertwining map into that quotient space. Yes. Okay. And then what that means is that the modular form you get by just taking the, the derivative has a transformation law, which is okay up to an additional term. So it's like an Eichler integral. Yes. You know, typically in these Eichler integrals and things, you end up with mod, you know, the transformation law, but whoops, there's a cocycle, mm -hmm. right? There's an extra piece. And so that's exactly what's happening here. In other words, when you, when you look at these higher derivatives, and of course this applies to all the Laurent coefficients, and as you could take 
an Eisenstein series, which depends on S classically, and you can look at any Lorentz coefficient you like, and the Oh no. Lorentz coefficient. Is it just for me or uh, Steve is cutting out? Uh, yeah. objects. Uh, right. So, so they're, they, so, and another way of thinking about it in the modular forms, of course, when perfect forms. Ah, such a shame. It, it was such an inspiring comment. I really wanted to hear, but uh, somehow, oh, there you are, Steve. Somehow you're you're breaking up. Um, so we we missed a lot of that uh, exposition, unfortunately. It, oh, you're also muted now. I, my machine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So where where should I start back to? I mean, see uh, <laughs> what happened when I have a, a, a induced representation depending on S, and I make yes. the Eisenstein series. And I, let's say, look at S equals zero and suppose there's no pole. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, and we can hear you okay now. Yeah. You, you were just getting on to the higher derivatives and then you sort of or cut out. My connection still flaky. I think you've, your, your image is frozen. So I think this is probably still my fault. Hmm. Okay, now you're moving again. Okay. I'll just, I'll just stop your video for a minute, Stephen. It might yeah, help. Okay, yeah, sure, that might help. No, I'm, I've had, I'm having trouble with my home internet right now. I don't know why. Um, can you hear me okay now? I can actually hear you very clearly now. So uh... Okay, good. So without the video, it's better, right? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, what I'm describing now is, is just that if you have a, like even, this is just SL2R even, you know, you have some induced representation, depends on S. When you form the Eisenstein series, it intertwines that into the automorphic forms, right? Mm -hmm. Intertwining meaning that it's equivariant for the action of SL2R in the induced representation and the action in the space of automorphic functions on SL2R, right? So there's a, it's, a, it, it's equivariant, right? So, but when you look at it, the Laura coefficients, let's say we're at a point where there's no pole. Mm -hmm. If I look at the value at S equals zero, you just get intertwining, right? That's an intertwining mm -hmm. map. And well, that will amount to the fact that you get some modularity in this usual sense, yeah. right? Now, if you look at the, at the map, uh, at the Laura coefficients at the first derivative, what will happen will be that map will be intertwining modulo the image of the first map. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now what will happen is when you transform, and so if you look at the function itself, you end up with a transformation law, which carries it back to a, a, the usual J, the automorphic multiple of itself, plus yeah. an error term, which lies in that subspace. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's the sense in which these Lorentz coefficients, when you take these expansions, like you're taking this G sub S, of Z1, Z2, which is yeah. typically like in Grossage and Eisenstein series, right? Uh, th that's why you get the, the, these things don't have a proper transformation law, but they act much more like an Eichler integral, where yes. you, which is a similar kind of thing. In other words, if you mod it out by the polynomials, you would get something equivariant, but of course you're not modding out by the polynomials. If you look at the actual thing itself, the, cause the transformation law involves a correction term, right? Which is in the, always in that subspace, right? Absolutely. Um, and so this reflects the fact that if you look at the space of automorphic forms, not L2 automorphic forms, but automorphic forms with just a weak, usual weak kind of weak growth conditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, then this space as a representation has a huge, has, is very far from being completely uh, um, semi-simple. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there are lots of non-split extensions in this space yeah. of, of, of representations. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is a huge theorem of Langlands in the Corvallis proceedings, which people maybe know or don't know. What Langlands proves is that every constituent of the space of automorphic forms, and as you have this on a general G, uh, Delic group, whatever, you have a, uh, for every constituent of the space of automorphic forms, meaning you have a, a subspace, which is invariant, and a subspace of that, and you look at the quotient, that would be the constituent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a subquotient of the space of this big space of automorphic form, every subquotient is constructed by derivatives of Eisenstein series. That's Langland's theorem. Mm -hmm. This is fully general Eisenstein series. God forbid what's involved in actually showing the proof. It's not in Corvallis, mm -hmm. but but in any case, this is a huge theorem of Langland's. 
And, and so I think what's true is that we should remember that in fact, in this space of automorphic forms, um, there are many extensions and, and so on. So these equivariance properties, you know, or modularity, it, it's not, you're not off the, off the map. It's just that you're deeper into the filtration of these things into, you know, you, you roughly see what I'm saying. I mean, there are these extensions in the space and you're, you're looking at sub quotients of the space of modular forms. And this comes into my work with Rollis all of the time. Mm -hmm. That's why I know it because that's exactly what we did when we were doing Siegel formula. You know, in the cases where there was a pole, we had to worry about what happened in the next term in the Laurent expansion, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there's, it's, uh, anyway, it, I think it's just relevant to the, um, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that. That was very inspiring, actually. And, and, and indeed, all you say, I mean, all the works you mentioned also of yourself and Valis, they've been very inspiring to us. In the piatic case, of course, it's, it's less clear what the analog is of weakening that growth condition. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. So And so in this case, the space that seems to come out is, um, is an extension, indeed, exactly as you say, of the space of classical forms by the space of mm -hmm. overconvergent modular forms. And so that's uh -huh. exactly the analog right. of what we're seeing here. Uh, except yes. I'm not sure if such spaces have been considered, but the fact that this Possibly, series yeah. begins to inhabit such a space might make the space also a little bit more interesting because here Absolutely. it's guided by the arithmetic, so you're forced in a set of direction, and that mm -hmm. might be a nice, uh, a nice first step to to actually consider the full space in the sense that that you're uh, that you were considering. Mm -hmm. so it's very inspiring. Thanks very much for yeah. that. Well, point. I mean, and of course, the other place where this comes up is that there's this paper that I wrote with Catherine Brinkman. Um, yes, I know this paper. Right? Yeah, where where essentially what we're showing is that in, in indeed in the in mock modular forms are really just extensions in the space of modular forms. In other words, that the a typical mock modular form is the the Horace Chandra module, which is the Archimedean, you know, representation involved, is mm -hmm. generally a non-split extension. And you know, in that paper, we could write we wrote down what are all the possible abstractly from Lie theory possible yeah. extensions, and we showed that every single one of them does actually arise. But the, the cutest one is exactly the one that occurs, occurs in the old uh, um, uh, derivative of the weight one Eisenstein series. Um, that's the simplest and most amusing of them. So maybe you want me to tell you that one? I mean, since we're using, I think everybody's gone so we can talk, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. But what did you, so, what did you just, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so so that particular one, of course, you, so you know this Eisenstein, this game with the Eisenstein, this is exactly what you're generalizing. And, you know, the, 